Okay, our, uh, our next talk today will be by uh, Brandon Vanderbush. Uh, Brandon is working with uh, Melissa Wolner and comes to us from an undergraduate at University of Wisconsin Stevens Point. And he will talk with us today about direct and indirect impacts of Gizzard Chat introductions in South Dakota impoundments. Hello, uh, like I said, my name is Brandon Vanderbush, and today I'm going to talk about the effects of Gizzard Chat. First of all, I'd like to say thank you to my advisor, Dr. Waller, the personnel at the South Dakota Department of Games and Parks, uh, Gene Gallon at Bill Mellon, Craig Simpson, Dave Lukeski, and Todd Sainz-Haber, as well as the federal aid of uh, sports fish restoration through the Game Fish and Parks. First of all, I'm doing these my project in reservoirs, which is a man-made lake, artificial lake, by impounding streams or lakes to make them bigger. Within these, the, within the reservoirs, you're looking for balance and interactions between multiple things to have a good fisheries. Specifically, to, uh, today I'm looking at the interaction of predator-prey balances. And often in these reservoirs, they are out of balance because of several things. They're the inflow of water, bringing in nutrients, other fish species, and help people manage the water either for energy, drop, agriculture drawing the water out of the reservoir and specifically some ways you can bring the balance back or the imbalance back into balance for these predator prey interactions are regulation so change the size of fish you can have you can harvest the amount of removal of nuisance species through netting or stocking and stocking you do it two ways predators such as introducing bass or other predators that will eat a nuisance species and hopefully drive down their densities to increase their quality, or you can stock prey to hopefully improve predator species to allow them to get better, bigger, provide better quality fisheries. The species I'm looking at that we're stocking as prey species are uh, gizzard shed. The reason why they're a good bait spe or prey species is because they don't have spines, they're relatively soft bodies, so it makes, a lot, it makes them a lot easier to eat for predators. They're uh, commonly stocked throughout the U.S. They're stocked a lot in the south in small res in reservoirs. <coughs> south Dakota is located on the northwestern part of the region, so they are natural in South Dakota, mainly the Missouri River and its tributaries. They've had they've had positive effects on species such as walleye, white bass, black and white crappie, in terms of increasing growth and increasing abundance. However, due to the due, they do have some negative effects with metal out effects in southern reservoirs where they intrude in the middle of the food chain, causing problems up and down it, such as competing with native species such as white crappie and bluegill, and having effects on predator species because they do grow out of the gate limits of predator species within a year or two. So they end up having high densities, relatively few small, uh, small specimens that can actually be eaten by predators and when they have these high densities they have reproduction issues where they don't have a lot of small reproduction for predators to eat and then get larger to eat the larger gizzard shed. However with South Dakota being on the northwestern part of its range, uh, winter kills are a common phenomenon for them where if there's 103 days of ice or water temperatures at or below 4 degrees Celsius it has an effect on the small gizzard chat because they don't have enough energy to survive. And usually what happens, either the whole population within the reservoir gets wiped out, or just a small pop portion of it, just allowing for some adults to reproduce. And this is good because then it can, can prevent uh, this negative effect that we see in the southern reservoirs in South Dakota. Here's, these are some reservoirs and some lakes that have been studied in South Dakota. On the western side of the state, these are three large reservoirs, uh, Shade Hill, Belfouche, and Angostura. Ward looked at the effects of gizzard shed stocking, which happened in the early 90s. Found that the walleye have increased growth, have increased abundance. Then these reservoirs, the Shade Hill and Belfouche are the only ones that are being stocked to maintain an adult balance. So the winter kills and predation are affecting the gizzard shed. Angostura hasn't been stocked since 94. So there is a population there that's surviving, allowing predators to eat them, eat the H0 gizzard chat. On the eastern part of the state in the early 
uh, around 2011. Van Dyke did a study, looked at the uh, effects of gizzard shed introduced into small glacial lakes. So these are natural lakes, they're not commons like they are on the west side of the state. So he found that the perch in these uh, reservoirs had little to no effect because of their induction. The walleye, they found, had an increased abundance with a neutral to positive effect on girls. So these gizzard shed are increasing the, the amount of walleye without decreasing the size. <coughs> um, here you see some reservoir, small pounds and reservoirs that have been stocked. All the dots, excluding the dot on o Oahe, are uh, small pounds. They stocked in 2015 and 2016, which was the major stocking of gizzard shed. There are a few lakes and pounds that were stocked before this period. Uh, one I'll get to later, but another one is the Little White River Project, which I don't have up here since it was stocked in the early 2010s. It's on the southwest part of the state. Uh, within these impoundments, a thing that causes the imbalance are the nuisance of black bullets. They're often overabundant and they are small sizes. Due to the overabundance, they don't get big. And the small sizes, they just escape gate limitations of predator species. And they're also, they're also difficult to eat because of their pectoral spines and their dorsal spines are sharp and rigid. The objectives for my project are to document the relative contribution of age zero gizzard chad to the food habits of predator species within the four reservoirs I'll be looking at. The second involving black bullheads is determine whether the body size increase of the predator species that we're hoping for will have a potential indirect biological control on black bullheads and hopefully reduce their abundance and increase quality. Uh, these are my study areas. Uh, there are two in West River, which I'll be sampling this coming summer, Bear Butte and Curlew, and I have two in East River. Uh, Alvin and Marindale. All these lakes were stocked in the 2015 period. 2016 Lake Alvin wasn't stocked with all the work rest were. The other lake I was talking about that had it stocked before this period is Lake Curlew. It's been stocked since 2012. And there is a assessment done by the Game Fish and Parks out there, a field survey, that they found that there is a positive effect so far because of the gizzard shad within them. Uh, lake Alvin is a lake that was stocked accidentally through flooding and several times before this, up to 10 years before. To just the first objective, to look at the food habits of predator species, we'll be sampling the last two weeks of every month from May to September. We're doing this because South Dakota, the gizzard chat become available the last two weeks of June. So we want to address what the food habits look like before they're available, right when they come available, and several months after they are available. The main sampling method we'll be doing is uh, electrofishing because we believe we'll be able to get as many fish as possible with this one gear type and hopefully reduce any mortality because of other gears. Uh, for our target species, if we don't get our target species in the amount we want, we'll be doing short term sets of gill nets and trap nets throughout the day and night to acquire the fish we would need. Once we collect the fish, we're going to get the total length of the weight cape with, so one side off the other, and aging structures. For all the fish, we're doing scales, excluding black bullets, we'll be taking the right pectoral fin and taking sections out of it to age it. Uh, for the food, food habits, we'll be doing gastric lavage to see what actually makes up their diet. We're going to pump their stomachs, preserving the contents and ethanol until we get to the laboratory. On the right, you can see our categories. We only have two categories because we're looking at the data and historical data and when the fish become mature. We found these are, at the time, right now, these are appropriate sizes because when fish get older, they switch from one prey source to the other. And that's why we're doing it in the two category systems and we're doing it from juvenile to sexually mature. Then each of these, we're gonna try to collect 20 samples per length size. We may do more and we're gonna, all these are our target species. However, we may not get them all. So we're gonna try to do our best job of doing that. Stomach contents, once we get them, we're going to identify invertebrates to order and fish to the species. After we do this, we're going to weigh and measure them. Once we do this, we're going to 
once we collect them, we're gonna weigh out five percent to see how much of each species of prey species makes up the diet by weight and by frequency by number. So all this data will be going over here in a second why we're collecting it. We're gonna be doing bioenergetics to assess the impact of gizz shed in terms of weight. We're doing this because bioenergetics gives you a rough idea on what's going on to the consumption, mortality, growth of these species. And we're gonna do a simulation because there's not a lot of pre food habit data in these reservoirs beforehand. We're gonna take the data we have, remove the gizzard shad, run a simulation like this to give us a rough idea of what's, what was going on before the shad introduction. And we're gonna be doing it after to see if there's any change in growth with the shad. Uh, this is the first hypothesis, which gizzard shad inductions will increase the growth in terms of weight of the predator species. Um, hopefully bringing a balance into the predator-prey interactions with the four reservoirs and improving the quality of the fisheries. So just the second objective, which was, remember, it was the biological control, basically, of the nuisance species of black bullheads. We're gonna do this by collecting age zero bullheads through sanding and potentially baited minnow traps and mini fight nets. We're going to be taking the length of the fish, the depth of the fish, and the weight of the fish to use an elongability curve. We're also going to be collecting the body width of the fish with the pectoral spines extended to see if maybe this is a bigger contributor or why they're not being selected as a prey. This is the relative vulnerability equation we'll be using. We're going to be using length frequencies and relative abundance from the data we collected on the first objective of predators and black bullheads to develop it. You can see instead of using a different equation, we're going to replace the depth with just the width to see if there's any change in the vulnerability. Which leads to the second hypothesis, which will the increase of predator growth terms of weight and size affect their vulnerability of black bullheads and potentially reduce their abundance and maybe provide another fisheries or target species people can fish for. Well, with the information from the project, we'll be able to gain information on what the what managers managers can expect in these other impoundments that have been stocked, as well as potentially stocking more impoundments, whether it actually increases growth of the predator species, or if gizzard shag can be used as an indirect uh, biocontrol for nuisance species such as black bullheads and other species. Questions? say growth of predators, are you thinking kind of focused on largemouth bass, small impoundments, is that the key? Um, we're really actually looking at all of them. Looking um, at all of them, but bass would be kind of central to it. Yeah, looking at bass and walleyes. Walleye, in research I've read, walleye do eat black bullheads, so do bass. So it's kind of just depending on how abundant some of the species are that we're collecting on. So uh, my question is, is, is growth rate how slow is the growth right now in those reservoirs for, say, bass? Um, that I don't know of right now. I could, but uh, they do get a good size, but they don't get big enough to eat the bullheads effectively. So. so, so what's the mechanism again for stocking gizzard shad and ending up with fewer bullheads? So, what they want is the bullheads escape the limitations of the predators. Usually, so they want to increase uh, stock gizzard shad because there's not a lot of forage in some of these reservoirs that allow the predator species to actually get to a big enough size. So by stocking them, the gizzard shad, they're hoping to increase the size of the predator species to allow them to forage on the bullheads because they can become a prey forage species because gizzard shad aren't available all year round. So if they're big enough to start eating age zero bullheads the next year. I'll just do one more thing they can eat till the gizzard shad are available. Uh, 
Um, could you tell us what a vulnerability curve is in fisheries? So, vulnerability is basically looking at what size a prey becomes available for to a predator, or what size a predator can eat prey. Basically, so how big of a fish can fit into another fish's mouth. Okay. okay. A lot of the predation vulnerability for black bullheads is you know in the when they're still in the ball, they're black, and they can hardly swim. And pretty much any predator, juvenile and above, can fit those in their mouth. You know, and the control, what we think we know, typically happens at that stage. It's, it's not big bass eating big bullheads, it's controlling age zero, so you get limited recruitment beyond that. So, so from what we've seen around, it's, it's the, it's not so much a predator size issue, it's is it a predator density issue. It's that, you know, bullheads are highly vulnerable as age zeros, but having enough predators to be able to suppress them is, is the issue. So what, so going along with that, do you, do you see a response in predator density? It, um, like in the Eastern Rivers I talked about, the van I looked at, they did see a relative increase. So that's also potential that could come from introducing the gizzard jet. They'll increase the abundance of predators and cut down on the age zero bullets because they'll start feeding on them. Does anybody from West River have any questions? So the question was, um, are the impoundments you're looking at prone to winter kill, uh, i.e., will the gizzard shad be able to reproduce or will they have to be stocked every year to get these fish larger to eat the bullheads? Um, that depends on the severity of the winter. If it's a mild winter, the gizzard shed will be able to survive. But if it's a severe winter, they would most likely die out. We'd have to stop them. Or by stocking them, we can control the population of gizzard shed, hopefully. Because they'll die out every year. But if you can have a small adult population that survives, you won't have to keep stocking and have this continuing forage that comes available every year. And it'll allow the fish to get bigger if they can survive. Otherwise, you have to stop the gizzard shed. Any other questions? Okay, let's thank both of our speakers. All right, thank you, everyone. We'll continue next week where we will have yet another fish talk um, and one presentation next week. If the remote people.